Welcome to the Foresight Health Roundup podcast, Foresight Health's podcast series for healthcare revolutionaries. Outcomes matter, customers count, and value rules. Hello again, everyone. This is Dave Berta, news editor at Foresight Health. It is Thursday, February 9th. Only three more days until the big game. Who do you have, Chiefs or Eagles? It should be a great game. The Super Bowl has nothing to do with our topic today, unless Healthcare Gov bought a Super Bowl ad. We'll see. Specifically, we're going to talk about a record number of people buying health insurance through ACA exchanges and Elevance Health buying Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. To give us the big picture takes on these two developments are Dave Johnson, founder and CEO of Foresight Health, and Julie Merchantson, partner at Transformation Capital. Hi, Dave. Hi, Julie. How are you guys doing this morning? Dave? Well, I'm just about to head out to Utah for this year's Mindshare Conference in Park City. It's an invitation-only event held every two years right after the Super Bowl. It's a forward-looking confab that tackles the big healthcare issues and highlights Intermountain's advances. The reason I'm talking about it is Mindshare is the brainchild of Bert Zimmerle, Intermountain's longstanding and highly respected CFO. And this year's conference is particularly poignant because Bert will retire from Intermountain at the end of the conference on Tuesday. He's a giant in healthcare finance, folksy, incisive, always nudging the industry to be better. His retirement letter ended with this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. Isn't that the truth? So here's a shout out and congratulations to my friend, Bert Simmerly. It's going to be most interesting to see how he uses his powerful megaphone in retirement. Go get him, Bert. Got it. Thanks, Dave. Have fun at the conference. Julie, how are you? I am good. I just reconnected with someone. I think you guys probably know Jeremy Noble, Harvard professor. And he's coming out with a book on loneliness, which brings me back to some of our loneliness discussions that Health Evolution years ago. And uh, I'm excited for it. So I'll be sure to announce when it comes out. Yeah, we'll look forward to talking more about that. Thank you. Now, before we talk about ACA enrollment in a big blues conversion, let me ask you about your Super Bowl predictions. Dave, who's going to win, Chiefs or Eagles? No idea, but I will be counting the number of ads by pharma companies. 30-second ads only cost $7 million a piece. Money, 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 money. (laughs) All right. I'll make sure uh, you and I never watch a Super Bowl together. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Dave. Julie, who you got, Chiefs or Eagles? You know, I went to college in Pennsylvania and business school in Philadelphia, and everything in me wants to root for the Eagles, but they are just such a challenge. It's a hard one. I'll say that I don't know who I'm going to root for, but I'll learn a lot about fashion from those Eagles players. That is for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's great. Thanks, Julie. Well, I'll be rooting against the Eagles, and I hope they lose. Uh, They were the only team to beat Vince Lombardi and the Packers in an NFL championship game way back in 1960. The score was 17-13. I was eight months old at the time, and I'm still bitter about it. I refused to come out of my crib for a week. (laughs) And I I just wouldn't let go of those rails for my mom. You know, Philly fans really are unlovable. They they boo Santa Claus. They throw snowballs. I mean, they're so obnoxious. Yeah, Yeah. very challenging. It'll be interesting. All right. Uh, Here's something else interesting. Uh, ACA. Late last month, see <laughs> Big transition. Yeah, yeah, I'm working at it. All right, let's talk about the ACA and not the NFL for a moment. Late last month, CMS announced that a record 16.3 million people signed up for a health insurance plan this year through the federal and state health insurance exchanges or marketplaces. That's an 18% jump in ACA enrollment compared with 2022. 
Of the 16.3 million who signed up this year, 12.7 million are re-enrollments, meaning they had an ACA plan last year, and 3.6 million, or 22% of the total, are new enrollees. Dave, what does this tell you about how the ACA is working? And more broadly, what does this tell you about the direction of the health insurance market? And what does it all mean for healthcare consumers? In politics, there's red, there's blue, and there's green. And the green I'm talking about is money, not the environment. The big message in these enrollment figures is that markets work. Let me repeat that. Markets work, even in healthcare. Let's dig into it. This year's 18% jump in enrollment to a record 16.3 million people with ACA insurance comes on top of last year's 21% jump, which was also a record. Americans clearly love the product. These numbers also show that price matters. There's a concept in economics called price elasticity that measures the relationship between price and product demand. The more elastic a product, the more sensitive its demand is to price. So lower prices increase demand, higher prices do the opposite. I know you're familiar with that, Dave. It turns out that purchasing health insurance on the ACA marketplace exchanges is very elastic. As the price and deductibles have come down with the increased subsidies enacted during the Biden administration, demand for Obamacare insurance policies has skyrocketed. This has had the beneficial effect of stabilizing the marketplace for these Obamacare plans. Commercial insurers that were bailing out of the exchanges not that long ago are now in with both feet. 92%, 92% of enrollees had three or more plans from which to choose. Turns out competition works too. Another interesting nugget here is that ACA plans are capitated. The insurance companies offering the plans own the financial risk for the healthcare expenditures of their members. Under these full risk contracts, health insurers have a vested interest in keeping their members healthier, promoting early diagnosis and proactive treatment, managing chronic conditions, all good things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Capitation works. So drop by drop through Medicare Advantage, Medicaid Managed Care, and ACA health insurance plans, the government is slowly but surely shifting away from fee-for-service payment models into full risk payment vehicles. As this happens, the perverse economic incentives for the over and under treatment of patients, as well as the overpricing of services diminish. Hallelujah to that. So one last observation, I'm struck by the stickiness of the Obamacare moniker. The public has no idea what ACA marketplace health plans are, but they definitely know what Obamacare is, and increasingly they like it a lot. At this week's State of the Union, President Biden made his reluctant Republican adversaries stand up and applaud Social Security, even though some are trying to do away with it. As Obamacare becomes increasingly popular, it's going to be very hard to dismantle it. Evidently, Obamacare works too. So the positive change in the public's opinion toward Obamacare reminds me of Nathaniel Hawthorne's famous novel, The Scarlet Letter. In the novel, the story's protagonist, Hester Prynne, has to wear a big red letter A wherever she goes for the rest of her life to shame her for committing adultery. As time passes and Hester leads an exemplary life, people start to think the A stands for Abel or Angel. So guess what? Obamacare is here to stay. Didn't we have a parody song, Dave, that made that claim? I, we did. We did. We'll have to link to it from this episode. That's great. Competition. Music to my ears. That's great, Dave. Julie, any questions for Dave? Okay, Dave. So I saw that some of the largest signups were in Texas, Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina. What do you think of these increases in these states? And will they hold when the PHE is rolled back? Do they give you hope or is it kind of false hope that we're seeing you know, such huge increases? Oh, Julie, they give me real hope. And let me tell you why. It's impossible to go anywhere in South Florida, your old stomping ground, without seeing vendors hawking Obamacare with banners displaying that iconic O from the 2008 presidential campaign. And much of South Florida, as you know, is Republican red. 
The Biden administration has been smart. It increased the Obamacare subsidies as part of the pandemic stimulus bill. This makes the Obamacare plans much more affordable, particularly for lower income people in states like the one you listed that have not expanded Medicaid. The increased subsidies have stunted the growth of the uninsured population in these non-Medicaid expansion states. The good news is that the Biden administration extended the Obamacare subsidies through the end of 2025 when it passed the Infrastructure Relief Act. That gets us through another presidential election cycle with the probability of even higher Obamacare enrollment. Julie, you specifically asked about the ending of the public health emergency, which will happen in May. Uh, and as you know, and we've talked about it, this will lead to disenrollment over time of as many as 14 million Americans who currently have Medicaid health insurance. So expect many of these individuals and families that lose their Medicaid insurance to purchase subsidized Obamacare plans on the marketplace exchanges. This will obviously swell the ranks of Obamacare enrollees. So I'm expecting President Biden at his 2024 State of the Union address to force Republicans to stand up and applaud for Obamacare as its enrollment surpasses 20 million Americans. As much as they may hate it, Republicans aren't gonna be able to put the Obamacare genie back in the bottle with so many Americans depending on it and so many of their own voters buying policies. Obamacare really is here to stay. Now let's talk about this Elevance Louisiana Blues deal. Elevance Health is the old anthem. It's a publicly traded for-profit company that operates blues plans in 14 states. The Louisiana Blues is a private not-for-profit uh, mutual health insurance company owned by policyholders. Late last month, Elevance announced that it's buying the Louisiana Blues for an undisclosed price, in a deal that's expected to close by the end of the year. I would imagine that the price will come out at some point, given that Elevance is publicly traded and there will be a lot of regulatory approvals required, regardless of the price. Julie, what's your reaction to the deal? What does it say about the direction of the health insurance market more broadly? And if I'm a Louisiana Blues member, what does it mean for me? First, let's talk about the local blue. Every blues plan I talked to today is playing defense against the big nationals. They're increasingly coming into their market. Many of these blues have owned their markets since the beginning of time. And now they're actually faced with competing in every single way. And since most have roots in the commercial markets, but they see the market shifting very rapidly towards the government segment. They've been increasingly trying to compete in Medicare and Medicaid. And, you know, they've had to. McKinsey has a forecast by 2026, estimates that profit pools for the government segments will be about 50% larger than commercial segments, driven by, of course, accelerated MA. So a lot going on with national competition. As Dave talked about in the individual markets, you know, nationals are back in. And Dave, I don't know if you've seen this, but McKinsey also has this stat that the proportion of counties with a single insurer for the ACA decreased from 52% in 2018 to 6% in 2022. I mean, that's kind of amazing, the amount of choice that consumers now have in that market. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Amazing. And blues can no longer kind of own that, right? So what's a blues plan to do? They're getting squeezed from both sides. and. Steve Uberhai, the CEO of Louisiana Blue, is a smart guy. He worked for a much larger blue. He knows what it takes to actually compete in that market. And he's managing for the long term. He's managing for the long term of the constituents and members. And I think he sees a running on the wall and he knows that joining forces is going to be better for the state in the long run. So, you know, that's the blue. Meanwhile, Elevance. We all know they've been building out its non-insurance business, recently rebranded Carillon, and largely following the blueprint laid out by United, which, of course, Gail knows well, and Gail is super smart. So buying you know, a regional blue plan for Elevance is just pumping not only you know, 1.6 million more members and $4.5 billion more revenue through the kind of system, but more importantly, 
it's allowing Bell Vance to push more of those members into its much higher margin non-insurers business, Carolyn. So, you know, that means selling things like managing pharmacy benefits and delivering in-home care for patients. So it's a, it's a different ball game when they have that kind of um, offering. But honestly, one thing that you'll never really see written about, that's not true. It is written about, but it's not really touted. That is an outcome of these transactions when a large for-profit buys a non-for-profit is it throws off a foundation that focuses exclusively on the health of the people in that area. So when this happened years ago in California with the WellPoint transaction, it threw off two foundations, the California Endowment, which was the much larger foundation based in Southern California, and the California Healthcare Foundation, which is the smaller but much mightier and I would kind of say much more influential in many ways foundation. And these two foundations turned the philanthropic community on its head in California and have done a lot of very good reactive grant making and a ton of incredible proactive policy and innovative grant making. I mean, CHCF has an innovation fund that funds private market players to come into the Medicaid market and develop its tools there. I mean, they're they're very forward leaning. So I can only hope that the foundation that get stood up in Louisiana can be as impactful. So, you know, there are silver linings in these things. That's interesting. So let's let's keep an eye on that foundation because that's probably the key for consumers and market reform in Louisiana. That's great. Thanks, Julie. Dave, any questions for Julie? Well, I love that foundation point. That's real public benefit, not this ephemeral public benefit that a lot of these organizations put in their 990 statements. So that's not just a little silver lining. That's a big silver lining. But Julie, what I'd like to do is dig a little deeper into the mentality of the Louisiana Blues and this decision to sell. You said that they were thinking long term. They're a well-capitalized but traditional plan very financially strong. They didn't have to sell. So I'm curious to have you go a little bit deeper on the reasons why they chose to do so. And specifically, does this decision imply a long-term weakness in the traditional Blue Cross Blue Shield business model that primarily serves self-insured employers through administrative services only ASO contracts? Yeah, Dave, you and I probably hear and translate that question a little bit differently, honestly. But I'll say that I think about the challenge for the Blues plans as being one of focused on the commercial market. What it takes to run an ASO is very administrative, not very proactive, very processing oriented. And a lot of these Blues plans were started long enough ago and all adopted the same facets technology at the same time, which is ancient. I mean, if we have problems with Epic on the health system side, whew, the health plans have problems with their FASTA systems. And their, you know, their data management's really challenging. When I talk to Blues plans, more so than Nationals, I'll say, although Nationals have similar issues, they all have a very difficult time getting data out of their system to work with some of the smaller companies that we work with to carve out a certain population to be managed differently in a way that that population might need to be managed or to really sub-segment their populations in ways that start to really look at their health and managing their health more proactively. So here are these blues plans who've been managing the ASO business, very simple processing for years, are being asked to actually manage health, communicate with members proactively, not just send EOBs. I mean, we're talking about health engagement and periodic progress. They're, they're not set up for it and they know it. And some of the smarter CEOs have been building some of the tools. I'll say this, you don't have to be just be a smart CEO. You have to have the capital and the runway to have built some tools that they can then sell across the blues. That's been a business model that's worked for some, but you know, as regulation has opened up competition across state lines, the blues just can't compete one by one anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, when I look at the progressive blues plans like Florida, North Carolina, Oregon, Minnesota, they've moved pretty aggressively into capitation, consumerism, being able to carve out the different groups that you're talking about. I mean, the Florida blues have Guidewell, which is 
I don't know, in 20 states or something like that. So the ones that are starting to succeed are starting to look a little more like the big commercial ones, big commercial players, which leaves the small fry blues, I think, you know, struggling to sustain themselves. Right. So they're looking for a stronger IT infrastructure and more analytics capabilities. So uh, what's interesting to me is there would be no ACA if it wasn't for Elevance. Now, hear me out here. Anthem was well point when Congress was looking like it was going to shoot down the ACA, just like a Chinese spy balloon. Then Angela Braley, who was president and CEO of WellPoint at the time, said WellPoint was going to raise premiums by nearly 40 percent. Everyone went nuts, and then the ACA passed. If she had just waited to announce the premium increase, there would be no ACA. Think about that. She snatched victory from jaws of defeat, or defeat from the jaws of victory, depending on your perspective, much (laughs) to the uh, dismay of the health insurance industry, which opposed the ACA. So see, one person can make a difference. Now let's briefly talk about other big healthcare news that happened this week. Julie, what else caught your eye? Well, I think the M&A tenor is turning up a little bit. I saw some news about CVS looking like it's in the kind of final days of its work with Oak Street and acquiring Oak Street for $10.5 billion with a B. One Oncology looks like it might be transacting. Cotivity might be transacting. So we're starting to see some movement in the market, which I think is positive. Yeah, a lot of dollars flowing. Thanks, Julie. Dave, what other news happened this week that's worth noting? Well, I do want to put an exclamation point on the acquisition of Oak Street by CVS. Looks like that's definitely going to happen. And put that together with Amazon's pending acquisition of One Medical, One Walgreens ownership of Village MD, and the Walmart partnership with United Health Group. And we're seeing big retail giants move ever so methodically into healthcare, primarily through the Medicare Advantage program. I had an opportunity to talk to uh, Robbie Pearl this week, and he made the observation that when a pharmacy and insurer are together under one roof, they're two times as profitable as companies that don't do that. So paradigm shifting market force with the power to shift demand channels, probably worth doing a show on this topic, Dave. And then one brief thing I just want to mention is the pharma industry got a big win last week uh, in a ruling from the third district federal court that enables drug manufacturers to restrict sales to hospitals under the 340B program. Yet another body blow to hospitals. How many more can they take? Yeah, I had not heard that. That's very interesting. I know that 340B program has been a hot potato for a number of years. So uh, thanks for mentioning that. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to learn more about the topics we discussed on today's show, please visit our website at foresighthealth.com. And don't forget to tell a friend about the Foresight Health Roundup podcast. Subscribe now and don't miss another segment of the best 20 minutes in healthcare. Thanks for listening. I'm Dave Berta for Foresight Health.